It's time for the No Nonsense Roundtable. Insights to capture your imagination from people you know and people you'd like to know about. Each week, a different guest from a different walk of life. Now, here is the host of the No Nonsense Roundtable, Dom Genova. Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of the No Nonsense Roundtable right here every Saturday at 10 o'clock. And uh, I'm your host, Dom Genova, and we have a, another very talented individual uh, on the show today. And we've, we've had people from uh, the present, people from the past in the music business. And this is a fella who I, I think you're probably most, most known for uh, uh, Vanilla Fudge back in the day, but we're going to get more into that. His name is Carmen a piece. Is that the right way to pronounce your last name? A piece? Carmine, come on, you're from New York. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I. Is what they say in, uh, you know, Texas or somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got into that with uh, Felix Cavalieri. It's Cavalieri or Cavallari, depending on if you're from... Cavalieri. Cavalieri. By the way, uh, we have a mutual friend in uh, Jean Cornish. He says to say hello to you. Yeah, yeah. I know Jean a long time. Yeah, Jean. Well, the thing about Jean is Jean's, Jean's a Rochester, really a Rochester guy. When he comes back here to Rochester, he likes to go to Don's Original and to Savoy Bakery and stuff like that. But you're from Brooklyn. What, what, well, my, my daughter lives in Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn are you from? Uh, Borough Park. Okay, she, uh, she lives in Sunset Park. And, I mean, Brooklyn's taken a, a big, uh, a big leap forward since uh, since the day. Now, where do you live? Where do you live now? I live in Florida near West Palm. Ah, uh, yeah, no lake effect snow there. So, yeah. you, you know, the, the, one of the kind of crazy questions I like I like asking people, uh, Carmen, Carmine. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, there I go again. Is is um. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a silly question, but most people in the music business got started in the music business because there was a uh, a, a history in their family. Was it the same way? Same way with you? No, nobody in the music business at all. So, how did you get interested? Well, my bro- my cousin Joey played drums, you know, and I used to go to his house and bang on his drums, go home, and, and wanted to bang on something, you know. And uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, so then, uh, you know, little by little, I, get, you know, I kept banging on stuff, and they kept giving me toy drum sets, and then, then a decent drum set that didn't break, and then, you know, I started playing, took lessons and all that stuff, and then after me, there was my cousin Joey, right, my cousin Frankie, my cousin Anthony, uh, my cousin Tommy, uh, I think that's about it, and then um, my, my son plays a little bit, he, he doesn't really care about it, but he play, he can't play. So it was like you know, six or seven drummers on my father's side. Well, I was talking. I was talking to Carl Palmer, and he was. He was. Uh, the rumor is that he went to see a movie uh, about Buddy Rich, uh, a drum crazy, I guess it was. And and somebody said that you were inspired by by him too, yeah, Buddy Rich. Rich was, one, was Buddy Rich and Gene Cooper were my main guys, and it was Joe Morello and Max Roach. And I, I never met Buddy Rich. I got friend, I was friends with Joe Morello. I got to be friends with Buddy Rich. I didn't, no, no, I'm sorry, I never met Gene Krupa. And I was friends with Buddy Rich. And, you know, he was great. He was the best. My so, here's, a, here's a silly little question for you. You know, the pe- people talk about Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr, great drummer, or was he just at the right place at the right time? Well, he, he's, he's a good drummer for what they did, you know. He, he's not a great drummer like a, you know, but he's inspirational for what from the Beatles. He he was one of the first guys to play lots of songs on the hi hat, you know? Mm-hmm. And he and created drum parts rather than playing just drums. So that that's what made him great. You know, technically as a you know, he's not a butt rich, you know. Mm-hmm. But but he's 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 great for what he did. And he put it you know, he started something in in rock. You know that everybody did. They picked up on. Well, one of the things I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, I guess uh, uh, the Rolling Stone magazine uh, rated you as one of the ten best drummers of all time. Is that true? Well, I don't. I don't think it's true. I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, is it true? Is it true that that, that, that that's an accurate story? Not that you're you're, you're saying that you're one of the I ten mean, best of all time. I don't think. I don't think it's the best of all time. I think maybe in the rock field. Uh huh. You know, but you know, I mean, they're much better drummers than me. Jazz rock drummers, jazz drummers, 
you know, they have amazing technical feats. But, you know, I, I was lucky. I started something which people picked up on, which was playing really heavy, you know, really heavy drumming um, because there were no amplifiers back then. You had to bang really hard. I mean, now I don't bang as hard. I'm, I'm 50 years older. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, it was a different world back then. When we started. Yeah, and, and you know, that's um, what, what you're saying is evocative of, of uh, like I said, I've only had one other drummer on the show, and that was uh, Carl Palmer. And Carl Palmer, he, he, well, he's, you know, he's your age or our age. And uh, he was saying, as as you grow older, you have to be more cognizant of the fact that you have to be physically fit because it's it's not like playing, you know, playing a keyboard or something like that. You, 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 you put a lot of your body into what you're doing, right? Exactly. You have to be physically fit. And, you know, I have one of those Apple watches that when I play, I put it on the, the run sequence. And I get sometime when I do my solo, I get up to like 137 beats per minute Whoa. of the heart, which is high. You know, and my, my doctor says you've got a strong heart. You know, so I think it's partly to do to that. I work out, you know, not work out, work out. I do the treadmill, sit up some weights you know, every other day, and I, I try and practice on the drum pad every day because I feel myself slowing down, you know, so because of my age, you know, your muscles get weaker, you know? Oh yeah. 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 I, and you, you, I mean, you're still touring now. You're going to be, <laughs> or I'm, I'm going to try to help you out uh, as much as I can here because you're coming to one of my favorite places in uh, in the Rochester area, where's my friend uh, Jim Shelley and uh, Fanatics Pub. You're going to be here on uh, June 27th, which I think is a Thursday. Now, have you been there yeah. before? Have Have you been to Jimmy's I've place before? There. I've never been there. Our manager Bruce has been telling us it's a really cool place, and it's small. Uh, I don't know how loud it's going to be in there. Oh, it's it, it's wonderful. I have to tell you, I discovered it a while back, and it is one of those clubs where the performers enjoy performing because you're close. You're you're close to the audience. You're intimate with the audience. The ceiling is low. The place is decorated, like perfectly. You know, it it is it is small. It's intimate. It is. Um, it's just a little gem. It only holds a hundred people. So, uh, you, you know, well, you, I'm just wondering if I get my drum set on this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. usually play small places like that. Yeah, no. usually we play you know five, six hundred seat places. Yeah, stages are, are decent. We just played a place down here called the Funky Biscuit that holds uh, two hundred people and was packed out. And I was wondering if I can get my drums on the riser there, and they got a riser and a decent stage. You know, so um curious to see what happens well believe it or not there are only a couple of dozen tickets that are left i mean and that's you know that's, that's pretty darn that's pretty darn good but everybody i've had um, uh, an association with that played there uh enjoyed it and uh we're about ready to head into a break but i'm going to talk about uh, an experience i had there a, a couple of a couple of months ago with one of the performers and we're gonna uh, talk about that when we get right back well welcome back we're talking to carmine a piece who is a uh performer a, a drummer a musician uh a worldly guy uh used to uh, play back in the 60s with a vanilla fudge so let's talk let's talk first about that about the 60s how how the 60s were when did you when did the band start? And uh, tell me about a, a little bit of the stories about Vanilla Fudge. Well, we started in 1966. We were called the Pigeons. And we started in uh, Long Island with my manager on this club called the uh, Action House. And at the, at the same time, there was Billy Joel was in a band called the Hassles, and Leslie West was in a band called the Vagrants. And we were Vanilla Fudge, and I joined them in 66. And we you know, we, we had a manager who was uh, pretty wealthy, owned a bunch of clubs, and he, he gave us a salary to try and create music, to try and get record deals and, and make it. So, And we did that, and we did You Keep Me Hanging On, and that song, even when we did it live, before we had a record out, we every time we played that song, people gather around the stage and watch us play it because... It was such a great arrangement, so emotional, and, and the band was on fire doing it. And then uh, we got it. Uh, we got to cut a demo, you know, with this guy Shadow Morton, the producer. And then uh, that was the beginning of that AOR, uh, AOR FM radio, album-oriented radio. 
And on one of the stations, it was Murray the K uh, and Scott Muni. They were they were like spirit herding this kind of radio, and they would put us on the on the air with our demo with, along like the Beatles and and uh, the Beach Boys. You know, the Beach Boys, big people. And then they have the audience call in and rate the record, and see who wins. And we kept winning. You know, so Atlantic Records heard that, so they wanted to sign us. You know, they told us they don't. They hit the name the Pigeons. We got to change the name. So they did sign us, and we ended up asking everybody, "What should we call ourselves? What should we call ourselves?" And some girl came up and said, "Well, you guys are like White Soul, because we we did a lot of black music and we was real soulful. Mark Stein was an amazing soul singer." So we called it, that's cool, White Soul. We like that, Vanilla Fudge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so little by little, we, we released, you keep hanging on, we did a demo. And uh, that demo was always on uh, Scott Muni and Mary the K's radio show, which was an AOR, you know, beginning of album oriented uh, radio. And uh, they put us up against these different acts like the Beatles and the Beach Boys and, you know, big acts. And we kept winning, like the audience would vote and what song they like best. So everybody voted for you to keep hanging on. So Atlantic heard that, and they wanted to sign us, but they hated the name of the Pigeons. Hmm. So, so we were kicking the names around, so some girls said, you, look, you guys are like white soul, because we did a lot of soul. Kind of be like, you keep hanging on, you know, R&B. And uh, we did our own arrangements of it, so we... We liked it. We said Vanilla Fudge, that's a good name, White Soul. So we took that name, Atlantic signed us. We released a single, hanging on. It went up to the charts, maybe number 70. Mm. Didn't do that great. But then the album came out a few months later, and we went out on tour. The album came out a few months later and broke in the charts at number 200. And then and after, after that, it jumped up to number 33. And after that... In two weeks, it was in the top ten. It was like number four. And the only thing that kept us from moving up was Sergeant Pepper. Uh -huh. All right? And uh, so in February, I think it was February of 69, 68, sorry, uh, we were asked to do the Ed Sullivan show. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually you don't do the Ed Sullivan show unless you have smash singles. But we have a smash album. So we did that. We were the first band to ever go on the Ed Sullivan show without a hit single. You know, and, but we kicked butt on that show. Hmm. Really kicked butt on the show. I mean, I, we were so animated. I looked like I was attacking my drums on the hangout. So. <laughs> and then the next show, when we did it, it was, we you know, had the Ludwig endorsement with these big drums. It was fantastic, you know. And, and again, we looked like we were, you know, attacking our drums. <laughs> And everybody looked like they were like on acid or some crazy drugs. Uh, some people that looked at it lately said, oh, whatever that drummer's on, I want some. <laughs> okay, that brings me. That brings me. And those, and those, and, and those things are still on TV. What, that, me, me TV. They're on, you know? Well, that brings me to something that uh, your friend Bruce Pilato um, uh, tipped me on, and he said that. Uh, uh, this this character on um, uh, uh, on uh, this Jim Henson character uh, oh, it, the Muppets. is the Muppets. It, yeah the Muppets <laughs> the animal the animal is originally supposed to be you <laughs> is that well, <laughs> modeled after well, you uh, well uh, that's what I I think you know somebody told me that when I was in Australia they said you know we saw you on TV I said what, what <laughs> and they, they showed me the Muppets I said wow. What is that? He said, that's the Muppets, that's the animal. They said, he looks like you. He's got all these drums around him. He's got black curly hair like you, you know, and he plays totally nuts like you do, you know? I said, wow, it does look like me. <laughs> now, uh, now, at your age, do you are you still like that now? No, no, I definitely slowed down a bit, <laughs> you know, because now they got PA systems and, and you know, I mean, come on, I was 20 years old at 
50. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things we call do at 20 we can't do now. I mean, do you, when you play basketball at 20, can you play the same game at, at 77? I doubt it. No, well, well I, I, I'm just as much a geek as I was back then, so I couldn't do it then. I can't do it now. So yeah, I'm looking through this. So from there, uh, let, let's see. Then uh, you, you you know, it's, it's sort of like I'm looking at all these people that um, – that uh, Bruce tells me that you know, and, and it's sort of like and I hope you don't take offense to the to the to, to the um, uh, analogy, but it's, it's sort of like the Forrest Gump story. Every every time there's something happening, you you happen to be there. The the number of people that you've you've been around and you've met and you've played with is is is, is amazing. That was a long time, you know. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, my, my big my biggest. Uh, thing like that, you know, was when I got a letter from Fred Astaire that I gave him my drum book. He wanted to learn to play rock drums. Yeah, tell us that story. That, 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 yeah. Letter. Yeah, I mean, that 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 is, uh, Bruce was telling me a little bit about the story, but t- tell me how you got to meet, uh, I guess it was uh, uh, Fred Astaire and uh, Gregory Peck? Yeah, I was, you know, play, when playing with Rod Stewart. Rod, Rod drew all those kind of people in L.A. You know, the Hollywood elite and the Hollywood all that stuff so you know like the Beatles would come see us and you know Tony Curtis and we used to hang out with Tony Curtis and things like that so we did a gig in LA we did six nights to form 20,000 people a night and backstage and at the gig was Fred Astaire and Gregory Peck so after the tour a few weeks later Rod got married to Atlanta at the time and then uh, Eric, uh, who's the uh, guy that produced Grease, I forgot his name right now, but he um, threw a big party for him. Alan Carr, that's who it was. And he threw a big party for Rod. And I went to the party and I was just getting my car walking in and I see somebody walking towards me and I look at it and he comes over and it's Gregory Peck. And he grabs and shakes my hand and goes, hey, you were great that night at the farm. I'm thinking, man, my mother would go crazy if she was here now. And I'm talking to Gregory Peck, you know? So so basically, he, he's telling me that when I did my drum solo, he was with Fred Astaire. And Fred Astaire said that he said to him, this is the best drum solo I've seen since Gene Krupa. Mm. So to me, that was like, you know, Gene Krupa's my idol. I said, wow. And then I'm thinking, Fred Astaire said that? And I'm thinking... Gregory Peck is telling me this, mm-hmm. you know. So I was like, "Wow, this is like a, like a, a three, you know, got, going up three levels," you know. Gene Krupa, Fred Astaire, and Gregory Peck. So then he tells me that Gregory, uh, that Fred Astaire is a, is a drummer. I said, "Really? I didn't know that." Of late, I, I've seen some videos of him on YouTube playing drums, uh, when you know before this this happened, and uh, he said, "But he never." can get the feel on how to play rock. I said, really? So, you know, I had a very successful uh, book called Realistic Rock, which is, you know, a lot of a lot of successful drummers have been through my book. And it sold, you know, 450,000 units. You know, so I said, look, I have a I have a drum book. He says, you do? I said, yeah, it's how it explains how to play rock. He says, oh, wow. Could you get one to me to give to Fred? I go, sure. So I said, okay, Greg, what, what do we got to do? And I'm on a first, you know, first name basis. You know, I was never one for Mr. Peck. You know what I mean? I'm from New York. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, here's the, here's the other thing I, I have to, I have to say, he says, uh, he's suggesting, um, Bruce is suggesting this question to me. So tell us what happened between you and Ozzy's wife, Sharon Osborne. That sounds like a great story. Oh, she fired me. <laughs> okay. Well, she told me that she said, your name is too big. You know, you need to start your own band. And she fired me. Oh. I was, I was on the tour. I was doing master classes. the music stores in the afternoon. So like 50, 50 students or 30 students. I can't remember the amount. And then I would give some money to, to UNICEF. And I was getting a lot of press. But she they signed the contract. And said that I can do this, and I had my own PR person, and I had my own shirt, Sandra, and and she signed the contract. But when it actually happened, she didn't like it. 
because I was getting a lot of PR and they were mm. pushing J.K. Lee. And then finally she fired me. And she and she even not only fired me, we had this big effect on the, on, on the tour where the, or the drum solo I was up on a 15 foot riser that, you know, was like, a, it was like a haunted house and there was a long stairway going up. On top of it was my drums. You know, for my solo, the stairway opened up and the drums would come back, my whole riser would come down on the track more towards the front of the stage where the audience was, you know? And I would do my solo and get a great reaction. So I did an article in the magazine, in a newspaper, talking about, you know, what I'm doing, you know, with Ozzy and the master class and everything, and the UNICEF. And then I was, they said, what's the biggest effect in the show? And that, that was the biggest effect. Mm. I said, I didn't think about the effect. It was Ozzy and Sharon's idea, not my idea. I would just happen to be the drummer on the effect. Now, it could be anybody on the effect. So that night, I walk into the into the venue, you know, a big arena, and all the way, everywhere in the arena, there was black and white copies of that article that I did in the newspaper, mm. all of them. You know, busting my chops, you know. <laughs> and then my roadie comes up and he said, he said, hey, chief, he said, Look at this. And showed me one of my shirts. And the head was cut off my shirt. Oh. You know, it's a picture of me playing drums. The head was cut off the shirt. I said, wow, how many shirts? And he says, all of them. I said, wow. So I knew Sharon did it. Ooh. Or, had, or had someone do it. So I went to the tour manager. I said, look at my shirt. Well, who did this? And he says, ask Sharon. Uh, I didn't ask Sharon that night. I went and played the show. And instead of the, the stairs opening and me going down, it didn't work that night. Mm -hmm. right? So I said to Bob Daisley, who's a bass player, has been with them for a while. I know him for a while. Do you think she tried to sabotage the show to try and make me look stupid because of that newspaper article? And Bob said, no, definitely. All right? So that led up to her firing me. Oh, jeez, jeez. So uh, uh, you um, you went from uh, uh, Vanilla Fudge and uh, uh, Jeff Beck. That that must have no, been a great. That no, must have been a great no, deal. No, I, I went to Cactus first. Cactus first. I thought Cactus came uh -huh. after. But Cactus is no. your uh, Cactus is your band now, right? I mean, Tim Bogus band. Ah, yeah, I came after us, nineteen seventy. And then Jeff Beck was like 72 to 74. And you played with, uh, I mean, the name of characters, you know, that you've played with or, or talent, Rod Stewart, uh, Sly Stone, Ted Nugent. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Who, uh, here's, a, here's a kind of off-the-wall question for you. I mean, who, who, who did you enjoy just uh, uh, being associated with playing with best, uh, playing most? Well, what what I, gave I you the most? Rod, I, would, I would say Rod Stewart. Really? How come? Yeah. Because he had a great image when we played with him. We were part of the band. We had a percentage of the tour. He was a, the greatest frontman singer of, the, of that time in 1970, mid-70s. Nobody could, nobody could touch him. You know, we'd do six nights at the Forum. I mean, maybe Led Zeppelin was the only other band that was as big as we were. You know? And you know, we were a band. It wasn't like Rod and the backup band. This was the Rod Stewart group. You know, and... He taught me a lot about songwriting. I co-wrote The Other Thing I'm Sexy and mm -hmm. I worked with him. And then the band wrote some other songs all together. He, he taught me a lot about image, about, you know, clothes, getting looking looking good, and making, when I was doing clinics, just to make an event about it. And that's what I did with Ozzy, and that's why she fired me. Mm. You know? And, uh, you know, I, I was with him seven years, and it was, it was great. It was the biggest venues, the, the, you know, the private planes. It was everything you dreamed about being a rock star. That, that was it. Mm. So uh, you said he taught you a lot about writing. So what what was the most important stuff about writing that 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 he he taught you that well was that, like the you know like like his lyrics were like every one of his songs is like a a, a day by day saying. Like you in my heart, right? Yeah. Tonight's the night. Mm. Do, you do you think I'm sexy? 
Yeah, you got passion. Ah. Yeah. yeah. All the songs, all the songs. Every picture tells a story. You know, they all the songs as far back as you go. You wear it well. You know? They're all yeah. you know, songs, you know, forever young. Some guys have all the luck, you know? Yeah. How many times do people say those things? No, I, I never thought about that before. But but what you're doing, I'm, yeah. I'm a marketing guy. What you're doing is you're engaging people with something that they can remember. Yeah, they and, already know it. Yeah. They already know it, you know. And, you know, not only that, but, uh, making a chorus, making it, you know, making the chorus memorable, like those songs, like those lyrics. Mm -hmm. And you know, have a pre-chorus, have a bridge, you know, have, a, have a verse, you know. And his lyrics are great. The great lyrics, and they make you they're engaging lyrics. Mm. Well, and you can hear the lyrics. I mean, that, that that's the problem yeah. I have with some of the music these days. I mean, like the, I have nothing against rap music, but I I, I I don't understand what they're saying. I mean, you have to listen to it how many different different times to to realize what the, what the lyrics actually are. Yeah, and what they are mostly is chicks with big butts and boobs, <laughs> and, you know, and. and Oh, oh let's okay, okay, you know, okay, yeah. okay, okay. I'm the only one okay, I'm let's the put it. Let's put a gov up. Let's put a governor on this, and I don't mean Kathy Hochul. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's a. Um, I'm going to give a no, like, I, like like country music. You know what happens when you, when you play country music backwards? What what happens? You get your house back. You get your dog back. You get your truck back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back into rock and roll. Let's like get back into rock and roll. So, so tell me, uh, 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 let's just let's just go ahead with the rest of what you think is interesting ab about your career. Now, uh, there is a story here uh, about uh, John Lennon and some lasagna. Is that is that it, it was you, you yeah, know anything about that's this? The story. Yeah, all, all these stories are also in my book. You know, I have a book called Stick It. My life's the sex jobs and rock and roll. It was more detail, a lot more fun. Well, let's talk but, more about that because people should, uh, I, I mean, these stories are fantastic and we can only do, only do so many uh, on this show. So so how do you get to that book again? What's the name of it? And, and how you know, do you? Uh, stick it, my life of sex, drums, and rock and roll. Sex, drums, and rock and mm -hmm. roll. Okay. Mm -hmm. and well, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at my CarmineMerch.com site, but it's a great book, I and mean, we sold uh, I sold a lot of them. And this story and the Aussie story is in there, but in more detail. And uh, mostly everything we talked about is in there. But as far as the lasagna story is, uh, it's great. You know, my brother Vinny played with Black Sabbath and Dio and all that. So uh, before he did all that, he played at the record plant in New York City, and. Uh, they were asked, uh, it was managed by the record player. He had a seven piece horn band. And they were asked to come down and do some hand claps on it, on an album. And, and they went down, it was John Lennon's uh, Whatever Gets You Through the Night. So that song had my brother and his band playing doing a hand clap. So they got to know John pretty well. Long story short, he asked, uh, John, do you like it? Italian food. My mother makes Italian food. She made my Italian food for Jeff Beck, for Rod Stewart, for all this stuff, you know. So, so he said, yeah, I would love that. So my mother made it for him. And nobody heard about anything, you know, for it. So I play Rod Stewart. Two months later, I'm playing with Rod Stewart at Madison Square Garden. As I said before, a lot of people come to see us. So John Lennon came with, I don't think it was Yoko, it was the other girl again. And, uh, you know, so uh, my mother and father at the party. This is at the party after the five nights or four nights, whatever we did. So my mother said, isn't that John Lennon? I said, yeah. I said, you yeah, know, I made lasagna for him. And Vinny gave it to him. I never heard if he liked it or not. I said, well, let's go over and ask him. I was over there. I met him that day, so he knew who I was. And I said, uh, so my mother said she made the lasagna. And my brother Vinny gave it to him. She said, oh, yeah, he did. So my mother said, how would you like it? He said, oh, I loved it. So my mother said, could I have the pan back? <laughs> I, I, I kind of, you know, died. <laughs> so did she and, get you know, it? The, the Italian, no, we never got it. The Italian pan, you know, she made all the lasagnas for years for the family in that pan. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm the product of two, uh, two Italian uh, parents, and uh, and yeah, I, m- mom had her favorite lasagna. As a matter of fact, I have her lasagna pan uh, that she used when I was a uh, was a boy. We still use it. We we use it to make the chicken cutlets <laughs> and lasagna. And she, he never, she never got the pan back. Is that is that? Hey. Yeah, so she never got the pan back. I think it was with May Pang. You know, after after. Uh, she- and I know her. I should ask if she ever seen the pants. <laughs> well, yeah, you know that the pan. You probably could sell the pan, you know, on the internet now for you know thousands of dollars. A pan that yeah. John Lennon touched. But, but so John Lennon. So what you're really saying in in English is he, he was he, he was kind of a mooch, I guess, right? Uh, he didn't know. Probably, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, what? He's not Italian. Well, yeah. What? 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 He didn't. I don't know if he cooked. Yeah, what, what what you know what what a what a what what a what do English guys know about Italian? You know, I mean, Italian. I know, you yeah, know, but so he gave it. him. The, yeah, he shouldn't have gave it to him in the in the pan. That's right. Yeah, right. He should have gave it to him in you know like uh, on a plate or something you know, with aluminum foil around it or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I guess the, he gave him the whole thing. Yeah, you, you, and you know, he just didn't know what the protocol was. You know, I, I have this philosophy that you either have great food or great cars. You, you don't have, you, you really don't have both, you know. So, but, but England is the only place where, you know, the cars really don't work all that well and the food's not all that good either, you know, so. Yeah, there you go. Well, shepherd's pie is really good. Yeah, okay. You know, but that's, that's, that, my, that's my favorite. Well, you know, when I was with the old English guys, you, you stop at a, you know, a, service station uh service area on the, on the motorway and you go in you get double eggs chips and beans you know and well, double eggs means two sunny side ups you know chips and french fries and uh like pork and beans but just beans what or, or beans or beans on toast Beans on toast good, or English good, breakfast. I've had English breakfast. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's got tomato good. and stuff like that. Well, if you're here and you have time, I will cook for you. I have cooked for Gene Cornish, uh, Chuck oh. Ricardo, uh, Jack Alaco. has got 11, 11 Emmys. Uh, there's a fellow who played at uh, Fanatics a couple of months ago. His name is uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Rush. Uh, Bobby Rush, 90 years old, just won his third Grammy. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, I, 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 Bobby's a riot, he, and he loved he loved fanatics because he could get in the middle. What does he do? What's he do? Uh, he has a uh, uh, well. He played the Chitlin Circuit uh, Circus uh, Circuit uh, back in the day, and uh, then moved to Chicago. And he just got an album. He just got his third Emmy for uh, best traditional blues album. Wow. I, I, I actually have an interview with him. I'll send you. I'll send you a link to the interview. I mean, the cool wow. I mean, one of the coolest guys ever. Oh yeah, I made him. Uh, I made him a spaghetti and meat sauce. So if if you're here and you want some good Italian well, food, tell Bruce I'm coming up on the day before the gig. So tell Bruce to get me in early and I go to dinner. Make me some dinner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I made I made my own uh, fresh ricotta the other day. You like the money got with oh, the uh, wow. the money oh, I the money ric- no, yeah. but you don't say ricotta. What? Is it regard? Re- regard. Right. Regard. Well, you, th- th- then you're you're from Napoli. Then you're you're not n- Napolitan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's yeah. what you say. Regard. Yeah. 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 That's right. It's yeah. okay. Here, here's a question: Is Sicily really a part of Italy? I don't know. Ah, oh, you see, that, that's a that, uh, that that that's a big bone of contention with people. You know, whether uh, Sicily. Yeah, know. Uh, yeah. You're from Sicily. Are you from, are you Italian? Yes, I'm from Sicily. No, that's yeah, not probably it. is. Yeah, <laughs> no. no, I made the you know the money got you make with the with the crepes, not not with the macaroni. You know, you make it like that. Yeah, My mother taught yeah. me how to make that. Uh, so, money got? Yeah, money got. I love money got. I, love the money got. I, I used to. My mother used to make money got, and we used to like. Have a contest who could eat the ma- the most. I mean, forget about. It. I was skinny as a blink there. Well, after so skinny ma- those days. And after mass on Sunday, right? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, and Thursday, and Thursday, and, th- and, and and Thursdays. Now let me let me ask you another Italian question. Do you call it sauce or gravy? Gravy. Ah, oh, jeez. Oh, In Brooklyn, it's gravy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but in LA, it's sauce. It's sauce. No, that's it. Yeah. So uh, let's see, uh, Sly Stone. That that, that that had to be well, interesting. That was only, I mean, that was only a track for Cleopatra Records. I didn't really play play with him, you know. But he, uh, 
You know, another story in my book where he was going to produce BBA you know, when he was at all screwed up on drugs. And we went there to San Francisco for a week, put all, all our gear, our roadies, and we stayed in Holiday Inn for a week, finally got into the studio. And he said, come on, play a groove, Tim, play a bass groove. I said, yeah, play to that. And then he got up, he's walking around, the door's open, he walked through the door and never came back. Mm-hmm. And that was, a, that was sly, but, you know, somehow he got a record deal with uh, Cleopatra to redo some of his hits, and I played on some of that stuff. But I, I didn't really play. I knew him, but I never played on gigs with him. Same with Pink Floyd. I played on Momentary Relapse of Reason album. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. I lost that someplace in this, in this bio that I got. All right, mm-hmm. So, um, but I mean, you're you're on tour now. You're going to this uh, this wonderful little, uh, uh, and it is, I, unfortunately, you know, for, or, or fortunately, it is little, which makes it very, very, very uh, appealing to uh, uh, the the artists. Sometimes the artists uh, likes uh, joining uh, with the crowd, and uh, of course, well, the, only if it you know, sounds good. Only if it no, sounds it, it's good. no. You'll you'll be very happy with the acoustics there. It, it's 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 fine. Like yeah, I said, I we're not really we're, we're not really on tour. We're just doing gigs, some gigs. We just did three gigs over the weekend, and we gig. We're doing those two gigs. I mean, on tour is very rough at, at this age. Mm. You know, I mean, unless you're touring like Rod Stewart or the Stones, where you got your own plane, your own doctors, your own masseuse, you know, your own person that does the laundry. You know, I mean, that's the way to go on tour. You know, if you go on tour with us flying in, you get picked up and you, you, you're in a sprinter van and you, you go to one gig and you drive 200 miles for another gig. You got a couple of roadies. I mean, you know, that's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, so, Well, well I, you know, I, I think the thing is, you know, people say that uh, – uh, you know, I, I say this all the time. People say I, that I really like music. You know, I, I like musicians more than I like music. And I think the thing about musicians mm-hmm. is that uh, I, I haven't found very many musicians that are doing it for the money. Well, l- luckily for me, I made all the money already. You know, th- these monies you make today is like po- pocket change. But, you know, I love to play. Like I live in Florida. Mm-hmm. People say, do you play golf? And I go, no, I play drums. Yeah. Yeah. And that's about it. Well, and, and that's the thing. And and the other thing is it, you, if you say you made you made money and you don't need, you know, to to uh to struggle for money. I think and, and I think that's not uh typical with a lot of people that have been in the rock and roll business. They, yeah, they exactly. They, they, I know a they, lot of friends that need to that need to work to make ends meet. Yeah. I think yeah. one of the most fascinating things is what Ringo Starr did with his Ringo Star his all stars. So I mean, so he, he he gets these guys together, as you know, that yeah. don't have enough of a book that they can have a whole hour and a half show with themselves, like Edgar Winter and whatever. But he puts them I all played, together. I played with Edgar. Oh uh, yeah, played with Edgar. yeah. And we have he has plenty of, plenty of time to show. But you know, like I said, you play with somebody like Ringo, you're flying around your own plane. You yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. Easy. You know, I, when I played with Edgar, we had. We were riding in a motor, motor was it recreate RV? Yeah. You know, and then me and the guitar player bought a bus. You know, and we were the three of us. So it was it, and a road manager, a couple of road managers. You know, and uh, it was it was great playing with that. And then you know it was hard for him too, even back then, because he he couldn't see when we had to fly. I had to go on the plane with him, and we go on the plane first because he couldn't see. Oh, jeez. You know? You know, so it's playing with Ringo is beautiful for him and, and those guys. I mean, I've done shows like that. I went to Japan with my a Carmine Piece uh, Super Session Volume mm-hmm. One. They had me and Tom Peterson from Cheap Trick, had Rick Derringer, had Eric Carmen, and my friend Dwayne Hitchings. And we played the Budokan, played a bunch of nice shows. And, you know, it was like first class, you know. But, uh, you know, unless you're playing mm. big big places, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I play. I have a sh- another show that I work, which I I love to play it because, uh, you know, I went to see Rod Stewart a couple of years ago, and went backstage and saw him. I watched the show. Out of out of twelve songs, he played eight songs that I was involved in. Mm. 
And I was saying, man, you know, I never get to play those songs again. Yeah. And then, then I found this guy that has his own show like that. It's called Tonight's Tonight. And I went up and jammed with him. He had over a thousand people there in the theater. And he said, let's be partners. I said, let's do it. So we're doing a whole bunch of shows. If you go to carmineapiece.com or .net, you see the list of shows I got. I got mostly those shows and some cactus shows in, in between. But it's mostly those shows. And we're playing mostly theaters. No clubs, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a great thing. There's every song is a hit. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. Don't, I, I don't play the, the some guys have all the luck. No, we do an intermission in between those songs. And then I, I, I come on, and we have a sax player that was with Rod 14 years ago, a woman named Catra. You know, and, you know, when I go up, I, I go talk to the audience. I say, you know, between me and her, we got 21 years of Rod Stewart on the stage tonight. Mm. You know, and it's different because we're, we're with him. It's not like a somebody trying to do a Rod tribute, you know? So we call it like a, you know, tonight's tonight, a true Rod Stewart experience with music and stories. Yeah. You know, so we, so we tell stories and we yeah, play yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah. And, and people love it. You oh, know, yeah, when yeah. I went up, yeah. when I went up and played with him, I never played with him, never rehearsed or not, and we played all the songs. Yeah. Hot Legs and uh, Sexy and Young Turks and Passion in my heart and you keep me hanging on all these songs that I played with Rod and it was easy I loved it yeah so now we're doing this on, in January we're playing that show with a 60 piece orchestra in the theater in Palm Springs wow cool you know so, so I'm still doing some interesting stuff yeah yeah you know yeah. and I love it you know yeah. I love it well you know there's there's something about uh, people that are in the arts is that there's something left here um, that wasn't here before you you know whatever yeah, whatever it that's is. right yeah that's a good way to put it you know there's there's something there's something left that wouldn't have been here if it was here it would be a little bit different but it's yours and you put your mark on yep. Uh, yep. on the world you know that's like me on your show. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you have one fault, and that's you. You think way too much of me. <laughs> we can correct that very quickly, but okay. we'll have to do that sorry, some other I'm time. Sorry, because I'm sorry, I said that. <laughs> well, I take it, it back. <laughs> Well, Carmine, I'll never say Carmen again. Um, you're Good. absolutely right. I had a friend of mine when I was a little boy, Carmine. Uh, everybody had a Carmine, I, I, a Sal. I, I, I don't understand how you get Carmine. Yeah. You know, how do you yeah. get Carmen? Yeah. Out of mine. Well, get men out of mine. I just well, I, I don't know. Although my grandson has a um, has a, has a very Italian name. His name is Lorenzo Pietro. Yeah, Lorenzo Pietro, which happens to be the first uh, first names of um, Yogi Berra, believe it or not. But yeah, yeah. And my uncle was named Giacomo. Giacomo, I, I love it. And we call him Jackie. We call him Jackie. But yeah. you know, my son when he was born, you know, I'm a junior, and my father was. You know, his middle name Charles, so he called him Charlie. Mm -hmm. Nobody called him Carmine. My grandfather's Carmine. You know, so yeah. I was named after him, my grandfather or my father, but I was a junior. So my son who lived in California. I said, you know what? I'm not going to name him Carmine because everyone would call him Carmen. Yeah. You know, so I named him Nicholas Carmine. Okay. All so, right. Last question. <laughs> last question. Last question. Okay. What's a spooliadel? A what? A spooliadel. You got me. Ah, oh, well, when you come to Rochester, I'll have to get you a spooliadel. Is that clam-shaped pastry that you have with the ricotta in the inside? It's called oh, a spooliadel. Oh, wow. No, I, I never know that. Ah. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to tell Bruce to get me in early, so we're going to go eat it with you. Okay. Well, okay. I, I, it's been a pleasure getting to meet you. You are, you're, uh, you're, t you're, you're talented, you're world-known, and you're a regular guy. And I got to tell you something, I, I, I like people that are regular guys. You're a regular guy. God bless you. You too, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We had a good time. Yeah, we had a good time. I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next, brother. next week, everybody, it's the same place, same time. It's the No Nonsense Roundtable. Thanks for listening. Tune in every Saturday from 10 to 11 on News Radio Wham 1180. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll make more.